Hey, my name is Michelle Wright. I'll be serving as the moderator uh, for this evening's debate between Dr. Shabir Ali and Dr. Douglas Jacoby. It's entitled, Is Jesus Prophet or Son of God? Thank you so much for joining us this evening and taking time out of your very busy schedules. Dr. Ali, thank you for coming to Georgia and joining us here all the way down it's from Toronto. Pleasure. It's great to have you here. This, in fact, is the third debate between these two men, and it's designed to be a very respectful debate, which is great. Uh, their first debate was 10 years ago, back in 2008, and that was on the topic, the true legacy of Abraham. Their second debate was just last year in Toronto, and they debated on violence, the Bible, and the Quran. Again, this is designed to be a very respectful debate that's in designed to engage you in some dialogue about Jesus, who lived some 2,000 years ago. In Islam, Jesus is a great prophet, but not divine. In Christianity, Jesus is the Son of God. So these two aspects of Jesus will be what we are discussing tonight during this forum in the next few hours. I say we because it's not just the men on stage here that will be talking you will actually get the opportunity to ask some questions. There is some time that is set aside for the audience to ask questions of both doctors Jacoby and Ali. What I ask is that you keep your questions to 30 seconds or less. If that helps, you might wanna write something down so you can keep it down. I have instructed the sound engineer, if you go beyond the 30 seconds, to silence your mic so we can be respectful and have as many people as possible be able to ask as many questions as possible. So we mm -hmm. want to be fair. I will signal the time during that Q&A. You'll come up here. You'll be able to ask your question to whichever of the, debater, the debaters you would like, or you can ask both of them. Now, speaking of these two fine men that are up here on stage with me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. Dr. Ali holds an MA and a PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Toronto. He also has a BA in Religious Studies with a specialization in Biblical Literature. Dr. Ali lives in Toronto where for the last 30 years he's been actively involved in the Muslim community and he's also quite involved with several interfaith dialogues and initiatives around the world. In fact, He's known as one of the top, if not the top, debaters in the Muslim world. So it's really an honor to have him here today. Dr. Ali serves as the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Centers International in Toronto, where he also functions as imam. He's also got a weekly TV program called Let's Let the Quran Speak. You can feel free to check out any past episodes. It's at QuranSpeaks.com. Follow him on Twitter at Dr. Shabir Ali on Facebook or at his website, shabirali.com. Dr. Jacoby holds a BA in history from Duke, an MTS from Harvard, and a DMIN from Drew University. He's served as a minister and pastor of several churches, both domestically here in the US and internationally in countries like Britain, Sweden, and Australia. He's currently a freelance Bible teacher and consultant based here in the metro Atlanta area and an adjunct professor of Bible and theology from Lincoln University. He's spoken in more than 20 majority Muslim nations and lectured at several Muslim universities. He's the author of over two dozen books, hundreds of podcasts, which can also be found on his website, douglasjacoby.com. You can also follow him on Twitter at, at Douglas Jacoby and on Facebook. Now, before we get to the opening statements, a little explanation of how the evening is going to go. As the moderator, I'm planning to move the evening along, keeping a note of time and helping shape and formulate any questions to the participants that you may have and working to maintain an equal balance of those questions going to either data. If someone is going over their allotted time, I will notify them yeah, and I will exactly. ask them to finish up their statement in the next 15 to 30 seconds. If they are unable to wrap it up, I will ask again the sound engineer to turn down their microphone so the next person will be able to speak. As you can tell, we're pretty strict about this. <laughs> Before each segment, I will state who will be speaking and how much time they have and in what order. So this leads us to our opening statements. Before we do our opening statements, if there's anybody in the foyer who'd like to come in, please come on in now, find yourself a seat. If not, the next time you will be able to come on in will be in 15 minutes. So if you'd like to enter now, we'd love to have you. If not, 
you're going to be listening for another 15 minutes before you'll get the time to come on in. Thank you. Feel free to come on in. Thank you and welcome again for coming. We've got seats. Please feel free to come find some seats. And now it's time for opening statements. Our first opening statement will be from Dr. Jacoby. It'll be followed by Dr. Ali. Dr. Jacoby, you have 15 minutes for your opening statement. First, let me see, uh, say what a pleasure it is uh, to see such a great crowd tonight all over, from all over the Atlanta area and even beyond. It's an honor to meet again uh, you, Shabir, for our third engagement, our fourth actual meeting. And it's, he's not just noted as one of the top debaters in the world. It's fairly unanimous. He's too modest to admit it, the top debater in the Muslim world. I better be careful what I say. And Michelle, putting the fear of God into us with discipline, we promise not to go over, okay? Because we don't, we don't want to be taken to the punishment room or wherever it is. All right. You know, um, Christians and Muslims have an awful lot in common, far more in common than they do that separates them, particularly when you look at the globe as a whole. If you're looking at Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and then you look at the great monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, we agree on a lot more than we disagree on. However, there is a fairly major difference that is under discussion tonight, and that is the identity of Jesus Christ. Because in Islam, the sin of idolatry, the sin of shirk, associating a being with Allah as a divine being, that's a very serious sin. You could see unforgivable. And the Quran is emphatic that Allah does not have sons. Yet in Christianity, the incarnation, God coming into our world through his son, is actually the central doctrine. It's not a peripheral thing. It's the central teaching of Christianity. So that's what we're here to talk about. Is Jesus only a prophet? Or is he actually son of God? And that's a position I'll be defending. Now, actually, you may not know it, but Quran supports many of the biblical claims about Jesus. The Quran teaches that he was born of a virgin. He did miracles. He, he raised the dead. He's coming back. It'll be the judgment day. Jesus is a messenger. He's an apostle. He's a messiah and more. But there are indicators, even within the Quran, that Jesus is more than just a prophet. I mean, that, the whole thing about the second coming, and we learn more about that in the traditions, in the hadith, the uh, teaching that Jesus is sinless, no offense to the prophet Muhammad, but there are three passages in the Quran that speak of forgiveness for Muhammad. But, so what is going on with that? And then we read in Surah 4, Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was a messenger of Allah and his word. Now that passage is saying that Jesus is a word that's not a messenger, that's a message. And I believe that that notion has come from the Gospel of John. So what is the truth? Is Jesus only a prophet or something more? And just to set things in the a time frame, Islam comes about six centuries. Uh, Muhammad dies just over six centuries um, after uh, Jesus died, and so it's quite a long time later. Well, what does that term son of God mean anyway? It can mean all kinds of things in the Bible. But the question for this evening is, when it was applied to Jesus Christ, what did it mean? And I believe it means a couple of things. It, it points to his authority, but more than that, also his divinity. How could Allah have a son when he has no companion? A question asked in Surah 6, verse 101. Yet Christians don't believe that God had a son, they believed that he was the son eternally. But I understand, it's common in the ancient world to have gods and goddesses paired together in the pantheon of gods, and if you study world religions, you see this everywhere. And I, I have little trouble believing that in seventh century Arabia, Christians had their whole pantheon of gods and saints. In other words, I think there was certainly a lot of idolatry going on and uh, Muhammad's message would have resonated with me. But Christians don't believe that God had a son, that he's always had a son, Jesus. God is spirit. Jesus is not God's son biologically. He's God's son analogically. It's an analogy. I'm not saying it's not true, but if you make it biological or sexual, then it's definitely not true. And certainly, Muslims are just as capable as anybody else of distinguishing metaphor 
uh, from literal language. Uh, in the Quran, you have the phrase mother of the book in Surah 13. In Pakistan, I understand sometimes Muhammad is called the father of the nation. In Arabic, I've heard if someone travels a lot, you could say he's a son of the road. But these are not family relationships. These are metaphors, and we use them in Christianity too. Two things I hope we'll be able to keep in mind uh, before I give you the evidence. And first, the Christians, the original Christians were monotheists. They believed in only one God. For them, the most important command was, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. Deuteronomy 6.4. And why am I talking about the Jews? Because Jesus was Jewish. Because all of his apostles were Jewish. The apostle Paul was Jewish. The base of leadership in the early church was Jewish. These were not people who are going to easily say, oh yeah, let's add some gods in. And the second is this. The word God in the New Testament, I'm not referring to the Old Testament, but the New Testament, God normally refers to God the Father. It can refer to God in the Christian sense, as we understand, Father, Son, Spirit, uh, but that's a very rare kind of usage. In the New Testament, God normally refers to the Father. Now, let me explain, if I can, how the Bible shows Jesus' divinity and how he is Son of God. It was very, uh, very surprising that any Orthodox Jew would have said, well, there's God, and then here's another God. But then that's not what the Jews were saying. But even in the time of Jesus and earlier, uh, there were documents circulating like 1st Enoch and 4th and Ezra that had a preexistent divine figure. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are scrolls, especially from cave number four, that say the Messiah will be son of the Most High, and the Messiah will be the Christ will be the Son of God. So that language is there uh, in the background. Then you've got the Old Testament, which prophesies, it foretells in several places, that at one point, God will come to our world. I think of Ezekiel 34. God says, you, you shepherds are corrupt. I'm going to come, and I myself will shepherd you. How will you do that? Well, he'll do it through a descent of David. It also says David will come. And yet, this is centuries after David's death. We have it in Malachi 3, one of the most striking passages. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So there would be a forerunner, and then God himself would come. There are other hints and indications. But the Old Testament itself looks forward to a day where God will break into history and appear and teach and lead. Now, sometimes Muslims will use uh, the Quran, particularly Surahs 2, 3, and 7, to say that the Torah may have been changed, it may have been corrupted. When I look at it, for example, in Surah 3, I see the charge that some Jews had corrupted the, uh, the Torah, the law, with their tongues more what they said than what they did. And I think that's an important point. At any rate, we can hardly accuse the Jews of rewriting or changing their scripture to support the Christian claims of the incarnation. That's something that we ought to think about. We have John the Baptist, who views himself as the herald preceding the coming of the Lord, and you notice this in Mark 1, the way Isaiah 40 and Malachi 1 are tied together. That's quite amazing. And he realizes he's completely unworthy of this one who is greater than him. In the letters of the New Testament, which are earlier than the Gospels for the most part, Jesus is routinely called the Lord. And because it's in Greek, the New Testament, and because the Old Testament that most of the Jews used was in Greek, Hebrew, yes, but in the Holy Land, but outside, Greek was the language. Uh, because of that, when the Jews are being told that Jesus is Kyrios, he is Lord, and that's the same word for God in the Old Testament, uh, one of the names of God, uh, that is quite significant. We have uh, Jesus' own brother, James, calling his brother the Lord of glory, and he is the Lord of glory, reflecting uh, the love and mercy and holiness of the Father. Paul speaks of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in Titus 2.13. The, 
There are multiple passages. When you look them up, you look up the reference in the Old Testament, you say, that's talking about God. But it's been applied in the New Testament to Jesus. Then we have Jesus' teaching. Jesus accepts worship. For example, in Mark 5, in John 20, with Thomas, he accepts worship, my Lord and my God. He claimed a unique relationship with the Father. That is, he prayed, my Father, we are supposed to pray, our Father. All four Gospels have Jesus as Son of God. The earliest Gospel, is, most scholars would agree, is Mark, written in 65 or so. Matthew, a few years later. A little bit later, Luke. A little bit later, John. In Mark 1.1, Jesus is the Son of God. This is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But that's a Roman term that's applying to the emperor. The emperor is called Lord and God, Savior. The emperor is called Son of God. He's acknowledged again as Son of God by an unclean spirit in chapter 3, by legion in chapter 5, and by the Roman centurion at his death in chapter 15. Moreover, Jesus acts like God. Third-party forgiveness. If Michelle sins against me, I forgive Michelle. <laughs> okay, but if Michelle sins against Shabir, I, I don't forgive Michelle. That's something only God would do. Read Mark 2. Jesus is David's Lord. Jesus says he'll be coming in the clouds in Mark 14, and coming in the clouds is something attributed to the Lord in the Old Testament, to God Almighty, his cloud chariot. Then we have the ancient creedal statement, Jesus is Lord. Well, since Jesus said you can only have one master, you can only follow one Lord, he's Lord, either he's a second God, or by making him Lord, we're following the true God. And all this means that the divinity of Christ is not some kind of development. It's there at the very beginning. An interesting fellow, an atheist New Testament scholar named Gert Ludemann, says that the Christian message was fixed, certainly in the first three years after Jesus died. That is, between, somewhere between the years 30 and 33. And yet these scriptures unanimously portray Jesus as the Son of God. And I am unaware of any ancient manuscript of the New Testament or any manuscript fragment. I'm unaware of anyone, any uh, manuscript that takes a different view that says Jesus is just, just like us in every way because he is the son of God and there's no evidence to show that that teaching has changed. So why don't Muslims believe? Do not they blaspheme who say Allah is one of three? But in the time of Muhammad, and if you read the Quran carefully, the Trinity is God, Jesus, and Mary. It's Allah, Isa, and Mar Maryam, because Christians are praying to a pantheon of saints and gods. And I understand that they've been doing that actually for several centuries. But Christians don't believe that Jesus is, uh, let me clarify this thing about the Trinity. We don't think Jesus is his own father. It's not like, well, Jesus is God and God's the Father, so Jesus had himself, and how could he do that? Well, he's God, he could do anything. Away with such silliness. What we believe is that Father, Son, and Spirit are equal in nature, but not equal in attributes and not equal in order. The Son was subordinate to the Father. He was the one sent to the earth. He is the one who obeyed his Father. And even at the end of time, when he gives the king back to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, he is still subordinate. So there's a difference in rank and attributes, uh, not just, but, it, uh, but, but they're equal in nature. And that means that Jesus and God are not identical. Unless you mean to say, is Jesus God in nature? Okay, yes. But is Jesus God? Well, well no, because it's much more than just the Son of God. It's not a question of one plus one plus one equals three. It's more like one times one times one equals three. Not arithmetic, but more exponential. And that explains why Jesus told us to pray to the Father through him by the Spirit, John 16, 26. The Quran itself tells us Christians to follow the Injil, to obey what was taught there, and that's in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 3. And yet Muslims hold that the core gospel message, something's been corrupted, but I would like to know what is the evidence. In summary, the Quran supports many of the Bible's teachings about Jesus Christ, but stops short, does not go all the way to say he's the Son of God, even though there are hints. As Son of God, Jesus has authority, divinity, and this claim is not late. It's at the very foundation of Christianity. 
in all the letters in the gospel, from John the Baptist to Martha to the apocalypse, where Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, that is the first and the last, identifying himself with God. In the presence of strong evidence for Jesus' identity, one should no more accept the verdict that he was only a prophet than one would say that Einstein was only a mathematician. One who says that shows he doesn't understand what he did. Oh, he's just a patent clerk. But in the same way, anyone who claims Jesus is only a prophet does not truly know who he is. As I'm reasoning, he is the Son of God and he is Lord. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who are uh, in the foyer, if you'd like to come in now, please uh, feel free to come on in and grab a seat. If you could do that quickly, uh, then we'll hear from Dr. Ali, but we want you to be able to come on in, grab a seat. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. And uh, if for some reason you do need to leave, there are screens in the foyer so you can be able to watch until you're able to return into the, uh, into the area. Thank you again so much. And uh, Dr. <coughs> Ali, your opening statements. Thank you, Michelle. I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and asking to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets, his messengers, all of the righteous people of all time. I ask him to repair the damage that was done in the Florida Panhandle and elsewhere with the recent Hurricane Michael. And I encourage all of you here to do what you can to give charity and to help in the relief and cleanup efforts after that great disaster. Uh, now, as for uh, our being here tonight, I, I thank God that he has brought us together in such an amiable atmosphere, and I thank Doug for giving me this opportunity to speak here, and all of you folks here in this uh, great and beautiful church uh, for uh, giving me the, the opportunity to speak here uh, before you. I want to thank Michelle for being here with her great radio voice uh, to guide us along. <laughs> and. Uh, um, I, I pray that God will bless us all here tonight, bless our families, our loved ones, keep us safe, uh, and uh, keep us guided. Uh, as for what will be discussed here tonight, I ask God to open up our hearts and minds for the truth that he wants us to accept for our salvation. And whether that truth comes from Doug or comes from me, it will be our obligation to accept that uh, truth. I don't want this to be Muslims versus Christians, but rather Muslims and Christians together in the mutual uh, search for truth. Uh, Doug knows uh, the Greek language. He can read the New Testament in Greek, so he'll teach me a few things. And uh, if there is something that uh, I stumbled upon and I have a question about, I know that Doug is here to answer my question. So we'll all come out more enriched at the end of this than uh, the way we came in. We will all be for the better. So my obligation tonight in this debate is to uh, deal with the question, uh, is Jesus a son of God or uh, a prophet of God. Uh, Doug uh, picked the topic and he built it as a debate. I would have said, let's have a dialogue. But since it is, it is built as a debate, that's good too, so that we can have clarity of thought and we can be very precise in uh, thinking about this. Now, one of the uh, issues in debates is who has the burden of proof for what? Now, uh, normally, if somebody is claiming something extraordinary, that person has the burden of proof. That person has to prove the extraordinary thing. Let, let, imagine with me. Uh, imagine that there is a certain disease that strikes one in a million persons. Now, we could not point to just any individual and say, well, this is the person that has that disease. For us to be able to point to that individual, we have to have some evidence and proof. And it has to be some reasonable evidence and proof. Otherwise, one in, uh, we only have a one in a million chance of getting it right. Now, uh, our Christian friends tell us that there's only one person in all of history, one human being, who was uh, the Son of God in the Christian uh, sense of asserting this. So that's one out of more than 100 billion people. I don't know the actual number of people who have existed since Adam. Uh, but you, you can well imagine the number. So if we're saying this one in 100 billion persons was the Son of God, he has this unique quality and characteristic about him, well then we need to know what is the evidence, what is the proof, and it has to be a reasonable proof that this person is to be called in this way, the Son of God. Now, what we're not discussing here tonight, uh, so that we be clear, we're not discussing uh, whether Jesus was the Son of God in a metaphorical sense. 
Because Muslims will point out that there are many persons who are called sons of God in the Bible, of course, in a metaphorical sense, meaning uh, the way in which one might say, you know, to a child on the street, you are my son. Uh, or Peter says, Mark, my son. Uh, but we all know that Mark was not his son. Uh, or Jesus uh, speaks to the Pharisees and he says uh, in John's gospel, your father is the devil. And in contrast, Jesus' father is God. Well, here we have a contrast. Their father is the devil. Jesus' father is God. Uh, so if one is metaphorical, in the case of the Pharisees, naturally, the devil did not give birth to them, uh, then it's also metaphorical in the case of Jesus in this particular place. So we're not talking about that. Now, we could have spoken about Jesus being son of God by adoption. So that's where somebody declares formally that I'm adopting this child as my child. Uh, now, of course, that would set Muslims and Christians uh, at a difference, but it wouldn't be such a major difference as what we're discussing here tonight. I believe that what uh, Doug has put before us is that Jesus was eternally uh, the Son of God. So he didn't become son of God at a particular moment in time, in which case it's not the case that God just simply adopted him. Uh, so he was always the son of God. So we're speaking about an ontological reality here, and that requires some proof. So how would we know that somebody is the son of God? Out of the uh, 100 billion persons that have walked the earth, how would we know that this particular one is to be given this particular designation, the son of God? Now we might see that somebody is a great man, and Doug pointed out, that the Quran actually shows that Jesus was a great man. In fact, uh, Doug is right. Uh, it seems that uh, in the Quran, Jesus is even more than a prophet. But a great man and more than a prophet does not make him automatically son of God. Uh, Jesus, in the New Testament, speaks of John the Baptist and asks the people, what, what did you go out to see when you went out into the wilderness? Did you go out to see a prophet? I tell you, more than a prophet. So according to Jesus himself, John the Baptist was more than a prophet. But more than a prophet does not automatically equate son of God. We have to see where in the spectrum and hierarchy of beings uh, does Jesus actually fit. And Doug is right. The Quran says a lot of great things about Jesus. I don't need to reiterate that, but let's get more to the point about what, uh, uh, how Jesus fits within that hierarchy of beings. So for Jesus to be called the son of God, uh, we might expect that maybe he himself said it. And, and so people picked it up and they believed in him uh, and, and they took it from there, all right? He said it, we believe him, and that's the end of it. Like somebody says, God said it, I believe it, and that's the end of it, <laughs> all right? So there's no question after that. But now, there is great question as to whether or not Jesus on whom be peace, when he walked the earth in Palestine some 2,000 years ago, whether he actually said, I am the Son of God, meaning in that ontological sense. It, there can be many instances where he ma means it in a metaphorical sense. There are instances where it says that God spoke to Jesus from heaven and said, this is my son. That could mean son by adoption. But now, to know that Jesus is eternally the son of God, we have to have some greater evidence than this. It has to be very specific. Maybe Jesus on one occasion said that I am eternally the son of God. But of course, there's no such thing in the New Testament. He didn't actually say that. So how did Christians come to believe that, that this is the title that should be applied to Jesus, to say that he is the son of God? My answer to that is that it, it came in a series of developments. Christians over time noticed that Jesus uh, you know, said some great things, he did some great things, they reflected upon that, and eventually they came to many different conclusions. Various writers of the New Testament uh, materials, the various 27 books that make up the New Testament, had different ideas about what to say about Jesus. Some called him Kurios, which means Lord. Uh, but the term Lord is an ambiguous title. It can refer to the Lord of the worlds, uh, which for Muslims is Allah, the only God, or it can refer even to a human master or teacher. And in fact, to this day, I, I met a gentleman outside who said that he is uh, Greek, and uh, I, I, we can check with him later on, but from my humble uh, knowledge of, uh, of the Greek language, and I'm still only a beginner, the term uh, kurie uh, is an address to, uh, 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 of respect to another person. So if you go to Greece and somebody addresses you as kurie, they only mean sir, they don't mean lord. So that same term, Lord, is translated uh, in the Bible as Lord for the Lord God. 
And it is also used many times in reference to Jesus. So some people, by using this term Lord for Jesus, have allowed a certain bit of ambiguity. So that sometimes in the New Testament, we cannot be sure whether the writers are talking about Yahweh, the only true God and the Lord of Lords, or they're talking about Jesus, the Lord Jesus. Sometimes they specify the Lord Jesus, but sometimes they're not so very specific. Now, Christians later on looking at this can say, well, yeah, it looks like Jesus is the Lord God. But against this, we can see that there are many instances where Jesus on whom be peace makes it crystal clear that he is not the Lord God. So what is he then? He can be addressed as Lord in the sense of master and teacher, but not as the Lord God. Now, I said a series of developments. We can trace some of this development. I hope if I walk around, the camera folks won't, won't get mad with me. If they have to make some adjustments, I hope they will, they will be alert to that. So, we can see that there are four Gospels in the Bible, and uh, Doug has rightly named them as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he's actually given the sequence in which these Gospels were written. You remember the sequence that he said, Mark uh, around the year 65 AD, and followed by Matthew and Luke, and then followed uh, finally by John. Now, we can look at these four Gospels uh, in their historical context, and we can see that the stories about Jesus were being transformed from one Gospel to another. That means Mark writes about three decades after Jesus, Matthew and Luke arrive writing a decade later, and John is writing a decade later still. And we can see that as we go from Mark to John, uh, the, the, the stories have been transformed. Now, suddenly Jesus is being called a uh, 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 son uh, of God more and more. Uh, something like once in Mark, uh, um, and then like a... Uh, or, or maybe three, four times in Mark, but then like a hundred times in the gospel according to John. Now, if John was, a, uh, was like 25 times larger than Mark, we would say that this is just a, a, a product of size. Uh, but John is only about maybe 30, 40% lar longer than, than Mark. So how does it have suddenly the term son of God in the stories of Jesus appearing all over the place 25 times more frequently than they occur in Mark's gospel. Now, look at Mark's gospel again, and uh, how many times does Jesus speak about the kingdom of God? Many, many times. How many times does he speak about himself? Very seldom. How, go to John. How many times does Jesus speak about the kingdom of God? Very seldom. How many times does he speak about himself in self-reference? I am this, I am that. Uh, about a hundred times. So, uh, for the actual statistics on this, I would direct you to a book by James uh, D.G. Dunn, the British scholar of international acclaim, a book entitled The Evidence for Jesus. So, what has happened between Mark and John at the two ends of these Gospels is that the story of Jesus has been transformed. Now, it's no longer about the kingdom of God so much, it's more about Jesus. All of these I am things, I am this, I am that, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, I am before Abraham was, I am. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Where are these statements? In which gospel? Tell me. In the gospel according to? John. Now, you might uh, think about this uh, yourself. If, 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 uh, let's say somebody came into this room and he said that he is God. Or he said something close to that. That would be the most important thing you want to say. You're chuckling already. And when you go home and talk to your family and friends, you're going to tell them, this guy came in and he said that he is God. Isn't that crazy? Well, uh, that's the one memorable thing about him. Everybody who reports about him, this is what they're going to say. Now, it will make no sense for you to go and tell everyone, there was a guy who came into the room and, you know, he was wearing uh, a necktie and, uh, and so on. Why these details and omit the, most important thing that he said. Well, if Jesus said that he was God or said that he was the son of God in that ontological sense, if he made such grandiose claims about himself, that would have been the one thing that everybody would want to report. All of the gospels would have it. Why is it that the gospel according to Mark uh, has such a paucity of such grandiose claims about Jesus and only the gospel according to John picked it up later? And we can see some middling position with, with Matthew and Luke. So there's 
the development. If, Mark, if in Mark, Jesus looks like a human being, uh, maybe slightly greater than a human being, then in Matthew and Luke, he looks greater. And then in John, he looks much, much greater. He's going through the ceiling. In John's gospel, Jesus is like the creator of the world. He is the agent through which God made everything else. He's not the almighty God, but he is close to that. He is the first agent through which God created everything else. God created him, and then he created everything else. That's uh, John's gospel's presentation of Jesus. There's only one true God, the one whom Jesus prayed to, according to John chapter 17, verse 3. But nevertheless, John speaks about Jesus in such a way that Christians can come away thinking, well, this guy is the creator of the world. So when we look up, we don't see the actual God. We we see Jesus. He is our creator, so he is God to us. And this is how the confusion has uh, actually uh, uh, proliferated over time. I only have a minute left, so let me very quickly sum this up by saying that Muslims and Christians have, as Doug said, a lot of things in common. And I'm so glad that we're here tonight discussing these commonalities. But it's important also that uh, we discuss the differences in in a, a in a friendly and cooperative uh, manner so that we all come, up, come away from this more enriched than we were before. Doug is going to teach me some things about the Greek language and, uh, and many more things, and, and I'm here uh, to learn. Uh, so as we reflect on these differences, we realize that uh, the, there is a continuing a uh, stream of revelation. God has sent previous prophets, as Doug said, in the Old Testament, these uh, narratives were there. Then in the New Testament, it picked up more speed. The Quran now is a final revelation from God, bringing us back to that reality, the true Jesus as he was before they made him son of God and even God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. For those in the foyer, if you'd like to come on in, please take the time now to come on in as we transition into the next portion of our program. Uh, That portion will be the questions program, a portion of the program between the two doctors here on stage. So our first point will be uh, Dr. Jacoby will be posing questions to Dr. Ali and Dr. Ali will answer and then uh, we're going to flip that. That'll be 10 minutes. So again, um, feel free to head on out. But again, it won't be another 10 minutes till you can return back in. However, there are cameras and uh, there are monitors outside in the foyer. If you do need to step out, you won't miss too much of the debate. And so now, uh, Dr. Jacoby, I hand it over to you. So you're saying that the understanding of Jesus was radically transformed between the time of Mark, 65, and John in the 90s. Not only between Mark and John, but there's, there's a transformation of which uh, we have two uh, mileposts. We have Mark and we have John, and we can see the transformations that took place between Mark and, and John. Uh, you know, as a biblical scholar, how the gospel writers have shaped the tradition. We understand how oral tradition works, how written tradition works. Would you not say, though, that the fundamental level of the New Testament, at the earliest source, Jesus is already viewed as son of God, a term reserved for the emperor? It's a political statement in Mark 1.1 to say not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Would you not agree with that? Well, uh, Mark 1.1 actually is not uniform in the textual tradition, as you probably are aware. The title Son of God in Mark 1.1 has been identified by some as not present in some of the earliest manuscripts, and this is why some modern translations of the New Testament omit Son of God in that particular Mm. place. Mm -hmm. This does not mean that uh, Mark does not present Jesus as the Son of God, but the question, uh, first of all, is what kind of Son of God is Mark referring to? Is he referring to Jesus as metaphorically the Son of God or an adopted Son of God? And when he quotes the centurion as saying, this man is the Son of God, according to some uh, Bible translations, that should probably be translated, this man is a Son of God, because for the Roman centurion, there were many sons of God. So so the Roman centurion conceivably would not have at this stage thought that God has only one son and this is the son. He's probably thinking this is a son, which means a righteous man. As Luke put it in his gospel, the centurion said, truly, this man is innocent. So that's another way of saying this man is innocent if we put the two gospels together. Right. But if you want the latest version of the Greek New Testament based on the oldest versions, it came out at the end of last year. It's right here. And Mark 1.1 1, 1 
the full version is there. That's the way to... Uh, the consensus that, that that is legitimate. Well, but okay. I mean, you're seeing a consensus, and, and that's fine. I will bow to biblical uh, scholarship. Good point. We, so we have to, yeah. Uh, some things are more conclusive than others. Yes. It, in Mark, as I've mentioned, Jesus acts as though he's God, forgiving sins, third party, describing himself at the end of coming back in the clouds. In Isaiah, in Psalms, in the prophets, that's what God does. He does a lot of things that God, God walks on the sea in Job. In Mark, Jesus walks on the sea. There's so many things. And we don't just have to talk about Mark, but, you know, Philip says, show us the Father, that will be enough. Well, Jesus isn't the Father, he's the Son. But he says, don't you know me, Philip? Anyone who sees me sees the Father. Because in nature, they're not equal in rank or attribute, but they're equal in nature. Okay, so let me respond. First yes. of all, with Mark 1.1, 1, 1, while I would like to bow to scholarship, I'd like to, uh, it to be known that uh, the scholarship is not uniform. For example, Adela Yarbo Collins, in her Erminea commentary on, on Mark 1.1, uh, 1, 1, uh, uh, just translates it, uh, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, full stop. No son of God at that point, and she explains the reason, because this is not present in some of the most uh, reliable early manuscripts. As for uh, the gospel of Mark and others presenting Jesus as being more than a human being, more than a prophet, or that he does things which we know that God in the Old Testament did, th that is not by definition what is meant by Son of God. Like, we have to have a definition. What is meant by Son of God? God, Son of God, as you defined it, is uh, that one who was eternally uh, begotten of God. I don't know if you use the term begotten in your presentation. No, but I but, could have, yeah. But you would agree to that. He's eternally begotten of God. All right. So then, uh, so Jesus walks on water. How do you know that he he was eternally begotten of God. All you know that he has is that he has a great, lot of great power allowing him to walk on water. So he could have been a prophet whom God allowed to have this power to walk on water. Satan has a lot of great power, uh, but uh, Satan is not considered by Christians or anyone else to be the son of God, eternally begotten of God. So uh, you have to have something that clinches it to say, well, this is what we're going to call Jesus because that's what son of God means. Well, and, and as and a term that was... That term was already in circulation as a term for the Messiah, as we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and intertestamental literature. Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am, ego in me. You know that phrase appears over and over in John. It's the name of God in Exodus 3. Okay, but, but, but notice what you're doing here with, with quoting previously Philip's question to Jesus, uh, show us the Father, and then Jesus saying, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, and now you are quoting John's Gospel again. What you're doing here is you're confirming my general thesis that uh, there has been a development such oh. that when Christians mm. want to find proofs that Jesus is either the Son of God in that ontological sense, or that he is God, you more likely find the proofs in John's Gospel. But I I don't want to neglect what you said about Mark's gospel when Jesus spoke about the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Bruce Chilton, a New Testament scholar, has uh, written an article in Bible Review in which uh, he examined the sayings about the Son of Man very carefully in Mark's gospel. And he says that sometimes Jesus is speaking to himself uh, about himself with that title, Son of Man. Yes, I'm but aware. Sometimes Jesus is speaking about another figure to come in the future uh, who will be somehow associated with Jesus, but it's not Jesus. So that great son of man who will come in the future in Mark's gospel is uh, not Jesus, according to Bruce Chilton. It's somebody else, because Br Jesus is always referring to that son of man in the third person. It, Jesus, and he does often refer to himself in the, thir in, in the third person. I don't deny that. Uh, Chilton's a fine scholar, but one of many. I mean, in a few weeks, I'll be at the biblical, the big conference in Denver. There are 10,000 biblical scholars there. Uh, we can find a scholar here and there to back us up on one thing or another, but we need to learn from them as a whole, not just cherry pick our favorite scholar to back up our point. Uh, Jesus is presented as divine more in John than in Mark. I'll agree with that. I'm just saying he's presented as divine. It's not Caesar who is God and Savior. It's Jesus. And that's the way he's portrayed. And I would challenge anyone in the audience to read Mark's gospel and say he's a prophet and he's not God's son.
Yeah, but I take it you're asking me questions here, right? These are questions for me to respond to. Let me, let me respond to that very well, quickly. Can, can, Mark, I, can I just interrupt yes, and say... You can do anything. Are, are, <laughs> um, are there questions? Because, again, you will have the ability to, to ask, Doug, and there will be some rebuttals. Yeah. So we do have just under three minutes all left. Right. So let, let me, um, I want to make sure that all the questions are asked and then you'll yeah. be able to ask these questions. Well, sure, Michelle, sure. that won't happen because but, I, but I here, have four uh, Doug, more let, here. let me respond to what you just said. Um, so you're asking about Mark's presentation of Jesus and you're saying, okay, in John, Jesus appears more divine than he was in, in Mark's gospel. No, he's uh, portrayed as uh, divine more often. More often, more not, often. Not okay. a degree difference. Let me not put words in your mouth, but let me get to the answer to that. In, in Mark's gospel, well, taken as a whole, it is very clear that Jesus is a, a great prophet. Uh, he has uh, he is God's Messiah. Uh, he has great powers, but he also has limitations. This is what is very important to understand in Mark's gospel. So in Mark's gospel, Jesus denies that he has uh, omniscience. He right. says of that hour, no one knows, not even the Son, but only the Father. Right. So if Jesus does not have omniscience, then he is not God. A, a man came to Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So Jesus is distancing himself from being praised to such an extent. Moreover, Jesus in some of his miracles obviously has limitations. Mark says he could not do any mighty works in his hometown. But of course, the later gospels change this from could not do to did not do. If we go to Matthew and Luke. So if Jesus healed some in, in, in a certain occasion in Mark's gospel, he healed them all in Matthew and Luke. You see a development. I don't deny the, the, the differences, and I don't deny those differences at all. Uh, do, but do we have time for these questions? Um, let me give you one, because maybe we'll circle back with some of this material when we trade roles in a second. You have a minute and a half. In, the, in Islam, the Quran, it, by the majority of Islamic scholars, is considered to be eternal and uncreated, right? Uh, these are, are terms that came up in Muslim discussions right. in, in the, um, in the medieval, medieval times. Yes. Uh, I, I don't want to revive those discussions now because... Uh, well, I, can't a lot revive, of this... I can't revive the discussion. I thought Miroslav Wolf did a great job in his book, Allah, uh, explaining where that came from. But unless I'm misrepresenting Muslims, the Quran is eternal and uncreated. So is Allah. I'm in Christianity, sorry, which we book have... did you refer to? In Christianity, we have a Father, Son, and Spirit being eternal and uncreated. In yes. Islam, you have the Quran joining Allah as eternal and uncreated. And were, were you referring to a book that discussed this uh, eternal uncreatedness of the Quran? Is that what you were referring to? No, you didn't. Okay. So I just oh, want no, to make no, sure I, I heard I mean, your question correctly. I was correctly. reading about a few years when, when Wolf's yes. new book came out. I, was, I, I read right. it. Now, the difference is so you this, have two... let, let me answer it very quickly because we only have half a minute remaining. Uh, so uh, uh, when, uh, the, the reason I don't want to get into this is that a lot of it is semantics. Like, what do you mean when you refer to the book of God? So some Muslims said it is eternal and uncreated because by the Quran, they meant the knowledge of God. And of course, the God's knowledge is uh, eternal and uncreated. As some who said that the Quran was created, they're referring to the physical object in our hands. And obviously, it's written on paper, which was created, with ink, which was created, and so on. So uh, here, Muslims debated with each other without properly defining their terms. So it is a non-issue, really. So this doesn't perfectly match the Quran in heaven. Uh, if I had time, I would have answered you. <laughs> I'll allow the answer. Okay, uh, so what we would say is that the Quran we have in our hands now uh, is a representation of that message which God wants uh, us to have for our salvation, and that message is already in the mind of God, and the mind of God is uh, reflected in what is called the lawhul mahfuz because it is related in a tradition. He said to the pen, write, and the pen asked, "What should I write?" And he said, uh, "My knowledge of all things that will happen up until uh, the." the last day. You're talking about Surah so, 25? Uh, not, I'm speaking about a tradition, not some uh, passage of the Quran. Not and this too shows that it's, it, okay. it's something outside of the, of the Quranic uh, requirement. Uh, this is something that comes up in Muslim discourse, largely based on what is mentioned in uh, other sources. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, for those who are in the foyer, if you'd like to come in, now would be the time to come on in. Uh, find your seat, grab a seat. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now going to do the reverse. So mm -hmm. Dr. Ali will be able to ask Dr. Jacoby questions and um, we'll have another dialogue and we'll allow 10-ish minutes uh, for yeah. that, give or take how long She's some of She's shaping the, the tradition. <laughs>
Well, you know. But she's still true to her original message. I am. I'm trying. <laughs> Shabir, yeah. Yes. So, uh, to begin with, uh, Doug, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls refer to the Messiah as Son of the Most High. Uh, but here my challenge to you still is to explain how you know that that Son of the Most High would be the eternal Son of God as opposed to, let's say, adopted Son or metaphorical Son, uh, such as, for example, you use the term Ibn Sabil in Arabic, which means Son of the Road. So, I, I was just saying that that, that phrase has, has been used before the time of Jesus, uh, as I also referred to the phrases in First Enoch and Fourth Ezra. I'm just saying the Jews were already thinking very much outside the box. So if you're looking for um, precedence to this notion that the divine could become human, you have it not only in the Old Testament, but you have it in some of the, those intertestamental places, even in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. Still with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, since you've read the scrolls, you, you know that the scrolls speak about three messiahs to become in the future, a priest, a prophet, and a king. One, so two, or three, if, depending on which scroll. Yes, I'm aware of that. Okay. So if, uh, if you say that the messiah is going to be son of the most high, then are these three messiahs going to be each son of the most high? I'm not trying to stake the whole case on Q4246 or whatever the number is. But the way burden of proof works, it's not that way. Am I allowed to give a quotation, to offer a quotation? Sure. Um, Annette Gordon Reed, New York Law School, demanding that individual terms of evidence amount to proof sets a standard that can only be met in the rarest of circumstances, either in history or in the law. The evidence must be considered as a whole before a realistic and fair assessment could be made. We'll understand Mark's gospel as we understand Jesus experientially, as we look at the other gospels, as we look at the Christian tradition. Uh, but my case doesn't come down to a single line in a Dead Sea Scroll or a verse in one of the gospels. I'm talking about the original, the ancient Christian position that Jesus is Lord. He is mm. God in nature, he is Son of God. Okay. Um, now, uh, you, you uh, spoke of, of James, the brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that you assumed that James is the author of the epistle named James. Are, are you assuming that? Um, it, it wouldn't matter for the point I'm making. I'm, I'm simply saying that all the documents in the New Testament have this idea of Jesus' uh, divinity. He's the Lord of glory. Uh, whether it was written by James's brother, the conservative view, or by someone else, uh, and they may be right, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to my case. Mm. Okay. Now, you mentioned the creedal statement that Jesus is Lord. Mm. Uh, so now, I, I spoke about the ambiguity in the term Lord, uh, the original kurios, and you know the Greek. Uh, so tell us, when somebody says Je Jesus is kurios, uh, does that mean automatically that he's the Lord God? Because if P uh, Peter, uh, uh, Peter says that Sarah called Abraham a Lord, uh, it, does, does Sarah refer to Abraham as her Lord God, Lord God? Or is this term kurios? The meaning of a word is not determined uh, by a lexicon. A lexicon only gives you the range of possibilities. It's determined in the context. It's quite clear if anyone who's read Genesis and then reads 1 Peter 3 that Sarah wasn't saying that Abraham was her God or that he was acting like a God in that way. There, it's clear, kurios means master, Lord in that way. But when we say Jesus is Lord, which is, as a scholarship shows, this is a, it's a baptismal confession. It's a creedal confession. We're not saying Jesus is a sir. Like, Jesus is a very respectful, respectable man. Why would you be prone to the lions for saying, yeah, Jesus was a good guy. It's when the claim comes into conflict with the claim that the emperor is making to be Lord. The emperor is claiming total lordship. Um, it's a totalitarian idea. And the Christians are saying, no, the government's not supreme. Jesus is Lord. And they're using the same word that their Old Testament uses for God. And so it's suggestive. It makes that connection. So we determine the meaning from the context and from the situation not from what it means somewhere else. And as in any language, a word can mean different things. We have to ask how it's being used. And I th I'm saying curios is used of Jesus' uh, identity as the second member of the Trinity. Oh, okay. So now I need to ask you about the Trinity. All right. Okay. So explain to me what is meant by the Trinity, because a lot of Muslims here would be totally confused about this. They want to know. Tell us what is meant by the Trinity. Trinity is... Um, it's a working concept that I find fairly persuasive, but we see often Father, Son, and Spirit mentioned together, not always in that order, but for example, the end of Matthew 28 or the end of 2 Corinthians 13. 
Um, some Christians think that you shouldn't use the word Trinity because it's not in the Bible, but then the word Bible is not in the Bible. So we have to say something. Trinity, we believe strictly there's only one God. But that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. So we're not, when we say Jesus is God, we never mean Jesus is Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, it, it, that would be nonsensical. We're saying he's God in nature. And it's not, they're obviously not three rotating gods or manifestations of God. This is not modalism. This is not Sabellianism. I know you've studied all that theology and church history. Bless you uh, for doing that. But that's not what Christians mean. They hold on to a belief in one God, only one God, but a God who reveals himself as a, a human in Jesus' earthly ministry through Jesus Christ. So that's what we mean. And we definitely don't think it's Allah, Isa, and Maryam, okay. as in the Quran. Neither do I, but let me ask my but it next does, question. But it is in the Quran that way. It's not in the Quran that way, but uh, let me ask my question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you say that Jesus is by nature God. And, and I think you will agree that God by nature is spirit, uh, from, given the biblical language about this. True? God is spirit in Christianity, yeah, John yes. 4, 24. Okay, so, so God is spirit, and Jesus is by nature God, so he's a spirit. True? Uh, true, before the incarnation. The yes. incarnation is, is a spirit joining with flesh. So before he incarnated into flesh, he was a spirit. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I presume that's the right way to put it. Yes. Maybe there's a better way to put so it. So presumably, sure. uh, there were at least two Holy Spirits, Jesus and what we call the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's the, the, the language you're using is alien to biblical theology. No, I don't think it would ever know. be put like, that way. Well, yeah, we're because not you asking would, about... Because, uh, because God, God is spirit. Yes. Uh, angels are spirit. Yes. Okay, anything that's not physical is going to be spirit. So yes. I'm not sure that this is actually helping us. Yeah, but we're asking about, like, ultimately, um, there are obviously two holy spirits. We're not talking about lesser beings who are spirit beings, whether angels or devils. But we're asking now, at the highest echelon, you have a trinity of divine persons. And at least two of them we can now identify uh, are spirits. So you have two spirits in the highest echelon, and both of them have to be holy. So you have two holy spirits. Well, the Father is holy too, so if you want to make it three or more, three. you can go right ahead. So you have three but, holy spirits. But you're spirits. moving, the Trinity is an analogy, and when you press an analogy at some point, it's going to break down. Yes, but then the question is, how did Christians come up with this analogy? Because you said that Jesus is the Son of God, not biologically, but analogically. So how did Christians come up with this way of saying it, such that it is so flaky that if you press it a little bit, it breaks down? And not only at this one point, but if we keep going at this for hours, we will see that this is how it's going to go again and again. Uh, like, no matter how you press it, it's going to break. So uh, how, how do you know that this is the correct way of speaking about God as a trinity, as opposed to, for example, the simple way of saying there is only one God. He sent his Messiah, Jesus. He was a human being, a great one. Uh, a great messenger, a prophet of God, um, but still uh, a servant and messenger of God. Right. In well, the Quran, yes. you have this Holy Spirit as well. You're asking me now. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Quran speaks about the spirit of holiness, Ruh al-Qudus. Right. But I don't say, and so you've got two spirits, Allah, or is the Quran spirit, or is it a you know, analog Quran. But you see, we, we, don't, we don't have a problem with the spirit of holiness. I, there is some ambiguity we're play, in the we're, Quran. We're, we're about playing with words here. God reveals himself through Jesus. Christians, monotheists, are trying to make sense of uh, who Jesus is and what he's saying about his Father. And that's where Trinity comes, yeah. from an effort to understand Jesus' teaching and from our experience of the Trinity in our lives. Doug, the, the, the difference is that when we speak about there being only one God, and we say the Quran is this book, this is a revealed message for us, there's no confusion in our minds as to who is God and who is not. Whom no, no, do we pray not. to and whom do we not pray to? So when we say there is one God, that's never compromised by our ever uttering three. I was only so, saying that there's a precedent for having more than one eternal, uncreated uh, entity in Islam itself. Uh, but, but I'm not asking about an uh, eternal and uncreated entity. I'm asking about the highest echelon, which only belongs to God. Uh, do you have three persons, and are the three each a spirit, each a Holy Spirit? And in that case, how does the Bible say there is only one spirit? 
One times one times one. <laughs> Not okay. one plus one plus one. What about uh, one times one times one times one times one times one ad infinitum? That would also be one, true? So you can have many Holy Spirits and still have one God. I don't know any Muslims, Jews, or Christians who think that there's more than one Holy Spirit. Uh, so I don't think it's so confusing. And that ends <laughs> the question point of uh, portion of this. And now uh, we will move on. Yes, thank you. <laughs> For those out in the foyer, if you'd like to come on in, now is your chance to come on in, uh, grab yourself a seat. We're going to move on to our rebuttal portion of the evening. And uh, this will, will, will again have some rebuttals from the questions that we've heard and what you've brought up. Again, a little bit later on, you'll get a chance to ask some questions. So uh, I'll be explaining that in just a little bit. But again, now is uh, the time for rebuttals. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Ali, you have the first rebuttal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to reset my uh, stopwatch here. Oops, and I'm not doing it the right way, so I'm going to have to look up there. No. OK, I'm set. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't see my timer up there, but that's okay. Michelle is here to pull me off <laughs> stage in case I go, go over time. Uh, so uh, let me say, folks, that uh, in the rebuttal, I don't want to uh, sound negative or to be overly critical. I just want clarification of the uh, important points that Doug and I have been discussing. You remember my point about the need for clarity. We cannot just say that Jesus was a great man and greater than the prophet, and therefore he is the Son of God, especially now, as it turns out, that in the background of this, uh, that, that if, we, if we admit that he's the Son of God, then Doug wants to make that that he is one of the persons in the Holy Trinity. So not only Son of God, but God as well. I want to say that this actually is part of what I spoke about in, in, in about the development. Now, Doug said that uh, God, Jesus is not Son of God biologically, but analogically. And that means that we're taking the term Son from what we know from human experience, and we're applying it to Jesus. And we're saying the relationship that, that applies between Father and Son, as we know it, that must somehow apply between God and Jesus. Jesus. But then, if you wanted to say that they're part of the Holy Trinity, uh, which means that they have to be co-equal and co-eternal, why would you call one father and one son, implying a hierarchy of being, an order, and, and, and different levels of authority? Uh, why wouldn't you call him, for example, twin brother? Now, the, the reason it happened like this in Christianity is that things developed, some things stayed, and then they branched off. There are parallel lines of development. So at one stage, people referred to Jesus as the Son of God in a metaphorical sense. That means God is with this man. At another stage, they took him to be Son of God by adoption. God has adopted this person. Later on, some people thought that because he was born of a virgin, that means he must be somehow ontologically the Son of God, at least for his human person. And then later on, they thought, well, he must have been son of God from all eternity. And so it goes from one stage to another. By the time they get to that he was son of God from all eternity, now they're making him God, true God of true God, as is declared in the Council of Nicaea. I know this church is not so much uh, particular about church councils, uh, but nevertheless, I'm showing where that development went. So now they declare Jesus to be true God of true God. But guess what? The previous stories that prove Jesus to be metaphorically son of God, adopted son of God, biologically son of God, and now eventually. So all of these stories are still there in the minds of Christians and in their writings. And the title son of God still applies to him. They cannot forget that title. That's why they're still referring to him as son of God and also God at the same time. But we all know that my son is not me even though some people might mistake him for me because we resemble each other so much. Uh, but uh, 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 when we uh, come to examine the matter carefully, we know that my son is not me. So if we wanted to refer to Jesus as co-equal and co-eternal with God, that should have been the declaration from the start. We don't need to go through the intermediary stages to say that he was the son of God. And we don't need to call him son of God, which implies a sort of hierarchy. So in short, I believe that I have shown 
that there has been this development. And when Doug spoke, he actually confirmed that some aspects of this development. Because notice what happens. In order to look at Mark's gospel, one it only takes uh, the few points which might indicate that Jesus is greater than a human being, omitting the parts in Mark's gospel which shows that he had very human limitations, which would mean automatically that he is not God. Especially limitations in knowledge, which means that he's not omniscient and therefore he's not the all-knowing God. Then we go to the later Gospels. Doug naturally uh, would find proofs for Jesus' high position more likely in the Gospel according to John than in the previous Gospels. And he even admitted that, yeah, the Gospel according to John is doing it more often. But, but he's, he wants to say that the Gospel according to Mark has done it already, has placed Jesus on the level of divinity. But his proofs one after another were examined during the Q&A, and, and, and we found that his proofs do not hold up. For example, John John chapter 1 verse, Mark chapter 1 verse 1, uh, it says the, the Son of God, but that phrase has been dropped from some modern translations because it is found to be lacking in some ancient and uh, reliable manuscripts of the Bible. And no cardinal Christian doctrine can rest on a disputed text. This is uh, something accepted by Christians themselves. Because if it could be this way and could be that way, and you build your foundation here, and this collapses, well then, you know, perhaps the other thing is right. So you have to have an undisputed text, and, and this is what is lacking in the gospel according to Mark to promote Jesus to the level of absolute uh, divinity. So in short, is Jesus a prophet or is he the son of God? Uh, we have shown that in order to say that he's son of God, we have to have proof. We don't have that proof. Therefore, we go back to him being a prophet of God. Muslims and Christians can agree on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody in the foyer, please come on in. And as we reset the clock, Dr. Jacoby, it is your turn for your rebuttal. Mm. The Quran tells Christians they should follow the revelations in the gospel. That's in Surah 3, Ayat 3. The gospels show us, but not only the gospels show us Jesus' divinity. In Mark, as we've seen, Jesus acts like God. He does usurps uh, things that only God would do. And he's uh, described it with that divine term, son of God. But we see the same thing happening in Matthew, in Luke, and in John. Now, limitations. You might say he's not God because he's limited, because he doesn't have all knowledge. You referred to, I think it was Mark 13, 32. Someone asked him about the time of his coming. I don't know, only the Father. Not even the angels know. But what the Christians don't believe that Jesus was Father, Son, and Spirit, or that he was the Father on the earth, they think he became human. And the incarnation means limitation. No longer was he omnipresent. He was not in all places at one time. He was geographically confined to one single place. He didn't have all knowledge. But that's not surprising to me because he becomes flesh. He got tired. Even John presents him that way. John 4, Jesus gets tired. He sweats. Uh, he's uh, he, he, under the pressures and temptations that we're all under, as it says in Hebrews 4. But we don't even need to go to the Gospels because earlier we have the letters that refer to Jesus as our great God and Savior. The letters that refer to him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or God. And I see that in Romans. I see that in 2 Peter explicitly. I see it in Titus, and I see it in many other places. The Quran uh, and the Muslim tradition will claim that the Muslim tradition will claim that the Gospels have been changed. Somehow they've been corrupted. They've been changed. But I say no. They've not been changed. There's no manuscript evidence that the Gospels have been changed. And Shabir did not give me an example of a, a manuscript that turned up that gives any problem for the Christian position. What I think Muhammad was saying is not that the, Christian, the Christians corrupted the Gospel. It's that they, uh, not that they changed the written Gospel, but they corrupted Christianity. I think there's abundant evidence for that. But there's nothing remarkable about such a claim because Jesus himself said in Matthew 24 that the love of most will go cold. John said there are many false prophets in the world, 1 John 4, 1. In 2 Peter 3, 1 to 2, uh, Peter says that there will be false teachers among the people. But there's no evidence that the core gospel message has been changed. And if, if people are just putting words in Jesus' mouth, well, then very well, uh, they, they, they made some mistakes. It would have been very handy if they're just making stuff up to have Jesus tell us what is the answer to the issue of the spiritual gifts, or what's church government, or and there'll be another apostle coming along. His name will start with a P. And, uh, you know, 
the Christians did not feel at liberty to put words in his mouth. This idea that the divinity developed, the Son of God developed, no, no, no. It's at every stage uh, there. Now, it's a common misconception in our day, and I think it's spread especially by that uh, New Testament scholar Dan Brown uh, of the Da Vinci Code, that there's a conspiracy that the church didn't want people to find out that Jesus wasn't uh, divine. They're afraid that uh, they would find out he was just a human. But this is anachronistic, and it's also the kind of thing someone says who hasn't read a lot of ancient history. Because even in the first century, it was much more easy for uh, the people in the Mediterranean world to believe that Jesus was a god than to believe that he was fully human. We have First and Second John in the New Testament because of this very problem. Christians, some Christians are thinking, well, he's t- so spiritual. Can he really have a body? The issue wasn't, uh, uh, was he divine? The issue, was he fully human? And the church had these councils that talked about it because this is abstract stuff and it's tough. Even atheist New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman, maybe the best known atheist in the U.S., that's quite possible. He admits that all four gospels, all four, not John, Luke, Matthew, but all four, Mark included, proclaim Jesus is divine. The deity is at the very beginning. He's portrayed that way. To me, there's no problem with this logically. Human and divine in one person may sound like a contradiction. How could you be God and human? But we have flesh and spirit uniting in one person. In us, we have flesh and spirit. So why not human and God? God becomes one of us. He said he would do it in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus made uh, remarkable claims. His followers endorsed those. And that is what accounts for the rise of Christianity. When you look at that and you look at how Jesus reflects uh, God as his son through his amazing miracles, even raising the dead through, uh, through his influence today, which is visible, we realize that This is not just a prophet, not just more than a prophet. It's actually what the early Christians were saying all along. Jesus is Lord, and we can experience that if we open ourselves to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking out. I don't necessarily see anybody in the foyer, but if you're in the foyer and you want to come in, now's the time. They know. So I want to be able to do that. Uh, Now it's time for summations, and uh, each of the doctors will have two and a half minutes to give their summations, and we start with Dr. Ali. Yeah. So very quickly, uh, before actually giving my summation, but using my time for that, I want to answer some of the things that uh, Doug is still waiting for for answers uh, uh, on. One is, does the Quran actually say that Muslims need to believe in the Torah and the gospel as they are now? The answer to that is no. Some people that advance that claim, but recently Sidney Griffith and some other scholars have uh, clearly uh, come out and said that the uh, the Quran's position regarding the previous scriptures is that the Quran sees itself as a corrector of the previous scriptures, that there were mistakes and errors from the Quranic point of view, and the Quran is giving us uh, what is correct. In the second chapter of the Quran, the 79th verse, the Quran says, Woe to those who write the scriptures with their own hands and then say it is from God in order to profit uh, by it, thereby uh, a little. So I do not take it that the Quran uh, uh, acknowledges the validity of the previous scriptures in total, but that the Quran is saying it has some previous uh, knowledge and revelation which came from God, but we have to be careful in how we use it. Notice that Doug actually admitted that Jesus did not have all knowledge when he was here on earth. Now this is highly problematic because it would mean that not only Jesus can do this, but the Father and the Holy Spirit, they could all abandon their knowledge. But how do you abandon your knowledge? How do you forget something that you actually know? even as human beings, to see that God uh, suddenly doesn't have all of his knowledge. This is, uh, to me, blasphemous, uh, but uh, Doug must know what he means uh, by this. In any case, while he was here on earth, he didn't show that he had all knowledge. The contrary, he shows that he does not have all knowledge. That means he is showing that I'm not omniscient, and therefore I am, at least at the moment, I'm not God. 
Uh, and so when did he actually become God? That will have to be clarified. Now, uh, Doug refers to Bart Ehrman. I don't quote Bart Ehrman. Uh, one of the reasons is uh, that uh, I don't believe in everything he says. And I think he's mistaken if he means by divine uh, the, the ultimate God. When he says that Mark, uh, in Mark also Jesus is divine. But if you mean that Jesus is in the hierarchy of divine beings, higher than human beings, uh, well then I don't dispute that. But as John Bowden has pointed it out. Uh, what uh, we saw the other Gospels doing after Mark, Mark must have done with his sources as well. Thank you all very much. Can, can I walk Jacobi? out? Walk out too? <laughs> yeah, <you may. laughs> all right, because if I were preaching on Sunday, I would walk out a little bit more. Jesus is Son of God at every level of the Old Testament. The letters, then the Gospels, the book of Revelation, read the book of Revelation and tell me you, don't, you can't tell this is talking about Jesus and he's described as God's son and he's described in divine terms. But there is a concern that the apostle Paul had. He said to the Corinthians, I'm afraid as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning that your thoughts will be led astray from his sincere and pure devotion to Christ. How so, Paul? He says this, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed or you accept a different gospel, you're putting up with it. You're putting up with that. There is one Jesus, but we have to work to understand who he is. Uh, there are many rivals to that Jesus today. Demotion of Jesus from son of God to a prophet, I think is exactly the kind of development that Paul had in mind. Uh, Jesus, of course, he's limited, addressing that last little thing there, because uh, he is limited in space. He can only be in one place at one time. He doesn't have all knowledge. He lives as a human. I mean, he's, his life is squeezed into the frame of 30-something years. He's limited, but that doesn't mean the spirit was limited and the father was limited. That's a category switch, uh, an error, where we're trying to say Jesus is God means Jesus is father, son, and spirit. And I'm not arguing for that. That would be nonsensical. Uh, he actually warns us, the apostle, that even if an angel from heaven should come, we should not uh, be led astray because the faith has been delivered once for all, Jude verse 3. So the Islamic charge of corruption really doesn't hold water. You won't find any support for that in early Christianity or in the manuscripts themselves. And Muslims should contend with the people of the book in the fairest way possible, uh, Surah 29. I said that I accept the Trinity because I've experienced the Trinity. Trinity is not a word in the New Testament. Uh, people wrestled long and hard with who Jesus was because he was not just remarkable, but he had such a miraculous and global impact. It took time to process, to think about this. I experienced that I came to know God as my father. And that's not very Islamic of me, but I came to know God as father through Jesus the Son by the power of the Spirit. Christians believe that we come to the Father through the Son by the Spirit Christian experience is therefore intrinsically Trinitarian. Whether we can spell the word or not doesn't matter. The evidence, check out Proverbs 18, 17. I don't have time to read it. But the evidence leads us to one conclusion. The ancient confession, Jesus is the son of God, not just a prophet. And that is the evidence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now's the time in our program where you get involved. And this is the question and answer period. And here's uh, how this will go. We have a microphone that's right here by the side of the stage. So we ask that anybody who has a question would come on up and be able to deliver your question, ask your question, formulate a, a line. Troy will be over here. He will help um, determine the order to be in because again, we wanna keep things fair. So we wanna make sure that each of the doctors gets a question posed to them. And so what we're going to try to do is alternate. Troy will ask you who you'd like that question to be posed to, and then we will then line you up with that. Again, we're going to keep you to 30 seconds or less in posing your question to ensure that as many people get a chance to ask questions as possible. Okay, we will, if we run out of time, I Let's apologize, go. we're going to do that. I will get to that as soon as we finish explaining <laughs> and we'll, we'll have the ability to do that. And um, again, if we could formulate a line and listen to that, that would be great. And our first questioner, uh, if you would go ahead, step up to the mic and um, direct your question to who you'd like to direct it to and ask your question, that'd be great. And then we Thank get you. to respond after, right? You will answer Good. the okay. question once it is asked to no, you. No, yes. the other guy. 
If, if that is who the question is asked to, that's correct. Yeah, just a point of order. Point of order. <laughs> okay. So feel free to ask okay. that question. If there is something that the other doctor would like to rebut, that's fine. Please keep those rebuttals very short, though. So as we can see, we have a lot of people who want to answer questions, ask questions. Thank you. Hi, my question is for Doug. Uh, two parts. First, when you worship Jesus or when Christians worship Jesus, how do you make sure that you're only worshiping, worshiping the 100% God in Jesus and not the 100% man? And the other part, you, paste, you uh, put a lot of emphasis on the word, uh, the usage of word Lord for Jesus as meaning Lord God. But how do you justify that with John 17, 3, where Jesus calls the Father as the only true God, or in Acts 2, 36, where Peter says that God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. So God made Jesus both Lord and Christ. So how do you justify that? Right. Um, the, say the first question again. On, so on basically, the when you're worshiping Jesus, I, I'm told that how do I keep both it clear in my mind? Yeah, hundred percent God and hundred well, percent Christians don't. Ima I, I, mean, I don't know what's in people's head as they worship, but we believe, as as the Quran teaches, that that Jesus has returned to heaven, and so I don't think of him as um, a human man, with human right? limitations. Uh, but I, I can see how it could be confusing if if you're visually imagining God with the flowing robes and the long beard, uh, right? On Earth, when he was on Earth, right. If, oh, because Jesus freely accepted worship on earth. In Mark, uh, in John, I gave two examples, but he, he accepts worship. So he's, people, what people are worshiping is, is God. They may understand that uh, Jesus is representing God. I don't know what, what's exactly in their head, but he doesn't de decline the worship because he is divine in nature. But, but to say he's divine in nature is not to say he's God as in Acts 2.36, God made him both Lord and Christ. Because um, so, that would be jumping between two different meanings of God. The and nature of God, because in Trinity, only the, the nature is shared, but the attributes and order are different. So that, that's all I would say, maybe. The second, the, when, there's a second question. Yeah, this John 17.3, when Jesus is calling the Father as the only true God. Well, because Jesus was a monotheist, and the Father is the only true God. But the Father uh, is represents God, but Jesus is God, the Spirit is God, so in nature. Is Say again. Jesus is not the only true God? Uh, well, he's, he's described that way in the language of 1 Timothy, but normally that's language we reserve for the Father, because in the New Testament, God almost always means the Father. Okay. These are great questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, next question, please. Okay, this is for Dr. Ali. Um, so ultimately, uh, the question of whether Jesus is the Son of God uh, comes down to two questions, right? What are the scriptures from God, and what do the scriptures say? The, okay. What are the two questions? I'm sorry. No, no, no. Those are not. I, I'm just You're saying it comes down I'm, to two I'm questions. I'm laying the groundwork. Yes, but that, I want to know the, the ground. What, the what are question the two? of whether Jesus is the Son of God comes down to two parts. One is what are the scriptures that are from God. And secondly, what do those scriptures say? Mm -hmm. So that's just the, the back. Okay, we need your question. Okay. Yeah, got it. Uh, so I want to be, get clarity on the Muslim position concerning the Jewish and Christian scriptures, perhaps described in the Quran as the Torah and the Gospel. Okay, are you saying that the original writings were flawed, or only that the propagation of those original writings were flawed, and if one could get to the original writings, then you would in fact have authoritative message from God. Okay, thank God. you very much. Okay, okay. Dr. Abu. So uh, the, the, the Quran speaks uh, highly of the previous scriptures because they contain revelations that were given to God's prophets, to Moses, to David, to Jesus. Those revelations that were vouchsafed to prophets, for example, Jesus, uh, those are authoritative and true teachings. But uh, the, the Muslim idea is that we do not have those original statements from Jesus himself. We have, for example, in the New Testament, words which are colored red, and these are said to be the words of Christ. But we've already seen in my demonstration how uh, the, the stories about Jesus, and I can add now, even the words of Jesus have been changed from one gospel to another uh, to make Jesus appear bigger and greater than he was. In fact, I've already spoken about John's gospel and how John's gospel shows Jesus as claiming things for himself 
love, which were not claimed in the previous Gospels. So this is a transformation uh, of the message of Jesus. So from a Muslim point of view, the original revelation which was given to God's prophets, those are authoritative and true. But we do not have accurate copies of those revelations in our hands today, especially in the pages of the Christian Bible. We have to move on. Dr. Jacoby, do you have a response to that? Well, I mean, we have, we have uh, biblical manuscripts that are way older than the oldest Qurans. And in that respect, there's, there's just no basis for some of these things that are being claimed. I have to also comment on the red letter thing. Uh, Christians don't think that the red letter words are more important than the others. That's a very modern innovation, only about 150, 160 years old. We think that the whole the whole New Testament, the whole Bible is red letter. It's all urgent, important, and a holiday, and a wonder, and wonderful good, good news. Okay, thank you. Please, next question. Yes, sir. My question is for uh, Doug. Uh, the, according to the Muslim belief, that we believe the God Almighty, creator of everything, he's Alpha Omega, and he's for everybody. His mercy is for everybody. But we see Jesus... In Matthew chapter 15, when a Canaanite woman come and offer the blessing, and he clearly say, I'm not for sent anybody, but I'm only sent for the children of Israel. Yes. Which, which uh, is what the Quran says about him, that he was only sent to the children of Israel. So if he is only sent for the children of Israel, and he is himself saying, are we all the children of Israel? Okay. And if, like you said, if the Jews in their book also, in the Old Testament, there were evidence about, you know, the, the God's coming, why not all the Jews became Christian? Why did not they accept all that message? And why don't they agree on that? In fact, they were the first okay. one. And so we, we, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Um, Matthew 15, I thought you were going to talk about Jesus implying that she was a dog or a puppy, you know, that, the canary on point. But he says, I've only been sent to the lost sheep in the house of Israel. He says a similar thing five chapters earlier when he tells his disciples to focus on the Jews. And yet this wasn't the long-term plan because in Matthew 1, we have Gentiles in the genealogy. In Matthew 28, we have a commission to go to the whole world. It was a question, not of limitation for all time, but just for a time. The gospel would begin with the Jews and it would spread out through Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Um, you said, why did, about Jews becoming Christians, a huge number of Jews became Christians. I mean, nearly all the Christians in that, the early stages were Jewish. Uh, of course, they continued to reject him, others continued to accept him. It was the same with the Romans. But to say that it was a failure, that's not right. There, many Jews became Christians. And uh, for the early Christians, as you know, the Old Testament was their Bible. The Jewish Bible was the Christian Bible. He is, he is for everybody, yes. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, we're just going to have to right. move on. Dr. Ali, do you have uh, I, I think it's a like very pertinent question, because if he was really the son of God, as the questioner put it lastly now, uh, then why is his message limited in his own words to only the children of Israel? In the Islamic conception, it makes sense. God sends many prophets to many different people over time, and then finally he sent a universal prophet, that is the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who is declared as a universal prophet in the Quran. But in Jesus' own words, he's declared, uh, he declares himself, Himself as a limited prophet only to the people of Israel and he specifically tells his companions do not go among the Samaritans for example now who took his message and made that a universal message in the Acts of the Apostles a Christian history book within the New Testament in the Christian Bible it is clear that there are persons who thought about this later on for example Peter and especially Paul who took this as a message to the non-Jews to the Gentiles if it was a question settled already in Jesus' own proclamation, if he had said, okay, it is only for a limited time, keep the message among the Jews, and later on preach it to the Gentiles, then there would be no dispute and no debate. Okay. But we are going to have to, I'm sorry sure. to cut you off, we all, we do want to make sure we get as many questions Absolutely. as possible. Um, so please, next question. Uh, question for Dr. Ali, and Jesus does say in Matthew 28 to go and preach the gospel to all nations, so he didn't limit it, but in Mark chapter 3 verse 11, it says, whenever the impure spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God but he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. 
So you said that we would expect someone to reveal the most important thing about themselves right away, and since we don't see this, it's basis for the compromise of the consistency of his message. But here we see that Jesus strategically did not want to reveal his identity at this time, which would be contradictory to your point about him not always revealing his identity. How would you respond to that? Okay. Uh, first of all, about Matthew, say, uh, Matthew's uh, gospel saying that Jesus said, go and baptize the nations. Uh, this uh, is uh, really a disputed uh, point because uh, Matthew's gospel shows that uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples and they worshipped him, but they doubted. So what was there to doubt? The whole uh, episode uh, requires some clarification. In any case, this is not Jesus walking in the flesh and blood that everybody knew prior to his crucifixion, saying that this is going to be his universal message. This is uh, an esoteric experience that the disciples of Jesus had, a sort of vision in which they are being told uh, by, to go and baptize the nations. Now, as for Mark's gospel, in which uh, the, holy, the, the, the devils uh, bow, uh, prostrate before Jesus, uh, the term prosikani autoi could mean that they do him honor, not necessarily that they're worshiping him. But in any case, if people, uh, the devils in particular, do this, th their actions cannot be trusted. We know that even those who are arrested Jesus were mocking him by pretending to worship him. So we don't know what the devils were actually doing. And when they proclaim him to be the son of God, uh, their, their proclamation is not necessarily to be believed. Uh, it, it is a very strange argument for us to say, oh, the devil said he's the son of God, therefore we should believe he's the son of God. Rather, we should be suspicious of what the devils say. Yes, and, and I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Ed, I'll, I'll just so. weigh in. I know I only have 60 seconds. Um, Matthew 28, I think it's verse 16, some doubted. This is a group of over 500 people. Um, maybe some of the 11 doubted, but either way, it doesn't say they were all doubting. It says some doubted. There's a difference there. Uh, he was not an esoteric uh, source of a vision. Uh, the New Testament shows that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He had an actual body. Not a resuscitated body, but a resurrection body. First Corinthians 15 explains it. And as far as uh, proskunesis or worshiping, you've got to determine from the context. Is it worship or is it mock, mock worship or is it just deep respect? But when and we see it with Jesus, it's as God. Okay, please, next question. I have a question, Dr. Douglas. Hmm. Who is the first man on this earth? Adam. After Adam... How many prophets came on this earth? If he, Jesus is son of God for Christian people, so Jews should say Moses is also son of God. Right? Because they worship Moses. And Adam is the first man. Why don't you believe the first man should be the son of God? Why are you coming down and down and down and then you pick up the Jesus only? Why? Where's the first man? Okay, the, the Jews, there's nowhere that I'm aware of in uh, Exodus to Deuteronomy where the Jews worship Moses. The, now, the phrase son of God is used of Israel as a nation. In a sense, they're God's son, but they're also God's bride. Um, son of God's used of the angels. It's used of political rulers. Um, we're simply trying to clarify terminology. I, yeah, if it were me, I would have had it... Uh, clearer earlier on, but as one of our questioners made a point, Jesus was not uh, revealing everything at the same time. He's letting people uh, uh, grow in their ability to, to absorb. But the Jews didn't worship Moses. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the point, but um, I'm trying to respond the right way. Okay. Oh, well, Adam is actually called son of God in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. But in, in a sense, all humans are God's children. We see that in Acts 17, even with the polytheists, the idolaters. Loosely speaking, we're all God's sons and daughters. Uh, but it's really a question of how the term is being used. The way it's being used of Jesus is very different to the way it's used of anybody else. Okay, and... and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, okay, next question. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry, we have to Maybe after on. we can chat. Ne next question. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Next question. I appreciate you both uh, have a lot to study and learn. My question is for Dr. Ali. Uh, we spoke about Mark 14 earlier when Jesus is asked if he's the Christ and the son of the blessed one. And in 62, Jesus responds in the affirmative, as Doug already quoted, and you know he would be at the right hand of power and be coming on the clouds of heaven. 
And so at this response, the high priest is irate. He rips his clothing. He says that Jesus has committed blasphemy. So if Jesus saying this was claiming to be the son of God metaphorically or as an adopted son, why do you think this would elicit such a strong and angry response from the high priest? Okay, so here too, the question is in this form. Um, the, the, the Jewish rabbi here, uh, or the head of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leader um, uh, is saying uh, and, and responding in such a way uh, to make it clear that he thinks that Jesus was claiming to be God. And therefore, we should believe that Jesus was claiming to be God. This is how the question is put. Um, and, and the answer is, why should we believe this person uh, when they are painted in the New Testament as uh, trying by hook or crook to put Jesus to death to the extent that they brought false witnesses against him? Uh, in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 2, Jesus healed a man on the synagogue, uh, in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And from that time on, they started plotting how they're going to put him to death. So they want to put him to death by one means or another, by false uh, methods or true methods. So we cannot take their reaction as an automatic proof that Jesus was claiming to be God. Second, as Bruce Chilton has pointed out, even if you look at this statement clearly, you will see that Jesus is speaking about the Son of Man in the third person, as though this is someone else. And Bruce Chilton says, this is really someone else in Mark's Gospel, the Son of Man, the eschatological figure of the future. Now, uh, uh, looking at it more logically uh, now, or for a third point, looking at it from the logical perspective, if Jesus uh, was God in the Old Testament and he gave a, a law to uh, the Jews that says, if a man comes to you and claims to be God, you put him to death, and then he comes in the form of a man and he claims to be God, what is he doing to the Jewish people? He's making it necessary for them to put him to death by the same law that he had given them in the past. In which case, it would mean that, that somehow Jesus has this elaborate plan to come and die, and he needs somebody to kill him, and he makes the Jews the scapegoat who will have to kill him by the same law that he gave them in the first place. So logically, it makes no sense to say that Jesus was claiming to be God. Dr. Jacoby, would you like to respond? Respond to which of those seven uh, points <laughs> that were, were made? Because normally the response is to the other response, not to the original question. Um, no, I have no further comment right okay. now. Let's, let's keep it Next moving question. along. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank okay. you. Sure. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Jacoby. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, You're welcome. As you guys were both debating here today, and we're not going to have time to go into every question, um, you mentioned scripture. Uh, I'm a Muslim. I don't know if you could tell. Um, <laughs> but it was, could tell. it was pretty simple when... Um, the, the doctor was mentioned in verses. In fact, you were mentioned in verses. I could go home, open up a Quran. I could look at those. I could verify it. I can verify he's not making a mistake, and you can't. In many cases, you also mentioned verses of the Bible. Not, I'm not a Muslim. So as a Christian, if I went to a bookstore and I wanted to go get a Bible so I could you know, verify some of the things that you were saying, um, I've done that before. It was very difficult because I wouldn't know where to begin. I wouldn't know what version, what standard, what would you say to a non-Christian who are going to look up some of the things that you were saying, what book would you have? Which one would you have in your library to, to, to reference? And in contrast, uh, the Sheikh can mention the same difference with, with Quran. Um, you know, we're so spoiled if you're looking for a book in, if you're looking for a Bible in English, there are more than a hundred versions and um, I, I could recommend 10 that are really good. The most popular in this country is the New International Version. It's, uh, you know, any translation, there's a trade-off, uh, whether it's strict or, or, or loose. There's a trade-off with clarity and a trade-off with, um, uh, well, uh, ease of expression. Um, but I, I, the NIV is what the public votes for. You might try the English Standard Version. There are lots of books that can help you. I actually wrote a book called A Quick Overview of the Bible which is intended to help people to see where to begin and who are these people and these books and these persons. I'd be happy to give you a free copy if you talk to me after the meeting, because that, that could help you. And you could check out the bibliography and find even better works that I reference. Okay. <laughs> and your, your name was? <laughs> Sid. Sid. Oh, that's right, Sid. <laughs> 
Yeah, Sid, there are, there are many uh, translations of the Quran as well, and they more or less give you the ba same basic ballpark meaning. Muslims have, um, uh, to a large extent, tried to stay close to the original Arabic, so we still read the Quran in the original Arabic language. Many of us do not know the language as a language, but we try to uh, still preserve the word of God in the original uh, language. And we have many people in the Muslim community who are Arabic speakers, so they can guide us further on the detailed meanings and, and the finer points of the Arabic uh, meaning. For a non-Muslim who wants to get a quick introduction to the Quran, on your way out today, uh, some of my colleagues will be uh, distributing some copies of the uh, English translation of the Quran, having already received permission from the church authorities here, I understand, for doing this. Otherwise, I wouldn't have mentioned this. And uh, when you pick up a copy of that uh, English translation, you want to know what it says about Jesus. Uh, so you go to the third chapter of the Quran, that's called Surat Ali Imran, the chapter of the family of Imran, and uh, Imran is given in the Quran as the grandfather of Jesus. So that tells us a detailed story about Mary and the message that came to her and how can she has a child when no mortal has touched her. Similar story is to told in the 19th chapter of the Quran and for that reason that chapter is called the chapter of Mary. So you want to look at these chapters first. You might want to go to the index at the back of the book, look up Jesus and see that his name is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. You may want to go to each one of those 25 places to see what the Quran says about Jesus. And if you follow that method. What does the Quran say about drink, drinking alcohol, about gambling, about family life, about social life? You can find that probably in a, in a well uh, preserve, in, in a well put together index, and that will be getting your feet wet with the Quran. All right, great. Thank you. Next question, please. Good evening. My name is Kendall, Kendall Knight. Dr. Ali, thank you for being here tonight. And Dr. Jacoby, thank you for being here as well. I really enjoy this. My question is this uh, for you, Dr. Ali. We see in Isaiah 53, verse 5, the prophecy about Jesus. It says, by his stripes we are healed. Then we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, 24 through 25, Peter says that we are the shepherd. He is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. We were like sheep going astray. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we know that the word reconciled defines in the Greek catalogue, which means that from the beginning, God knew that our hearts would be rebellious, and he sent Jesus to reconcile him to, to, to himself. Um, in addition, John 4, uh, 14, 6 says, um, really quickly, no one comes to the Father except through me. Why would Jesus make those claims? We see the consistency in the scriptures. How would you um, define that? As you see the Old Testament prophecy, which is several hundred years prior to Peter, some, Peter witnessing Jesus' and resurrection. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> uh, very quickly, when we refer to 1 Corinthians, we're talking about one of the writings of Paul, and Muslims generally do not recognize the authority of Paul. And of course, we know from uh, Christian history that Paul was a disputed figure. There were some early Jewish Christians who thought that Paul was a heretic, and Peter is the champion of the faith. There was a dispute between Peter and Paul. Paul mentions that in his letter to the Galatians, but as Bruce Chilton pointed out in, the, in his introduction to the New Testament, Peter's is not actually given in the New Testament, but you also quoted 1 Peter, so how do we make sense of that? Two letters are credited to Peter in the New Testament as though he wrote them. A second Peter is, um, uh, was widely recognized in the ancient uh, world of Christians to not really be from Peter. Modern scholarship concurs, and uh, 1 Peter is disputed. Some scholars th think that Peter wrote it, some think he didn't write it. What about 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah chapter 53? Now this is referring to a servant of God. Is so now we're back to saying that Jesus is a servant of God. Moreover, as some scholars had connected that with Hezekiah chapter 30, in Isaiah chapter 38, another servant of God to whom this passage actually refers. In any case, this is speaking about a person who will live long enough. God will rescue him. He will not die, but give him an extension on his life so that he will see his offspring. And this obviously does not apply to Jesus, but New Testament writers and Christians more generally have thought that this passage is a reference friends to Jesus. It is not. Would you like to respond quickly? I can't respond to all of that. It, it, it's, too, it's too many concepts. Uh, but those are great passages. Shabir is explaining it well, I think, from the Muslim perspective. I would encourage you guys, yes, go to the Quran, uh, Surah 3, Surah 19, but read the New Testament too. You're going to find that they tell quite different stories about Jesus. Um, Next question. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Jacoby. Hi. Um, I, was, uh, born, I was born Christian in 1999. I was blessed to uh, embrace Islam. One of the major 
Keats is differentiating in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Yeah. And quite frankly, the prophet that, is, that God Almighty dis, told Moses yes. he would send to the people versus the prophet in Deuteronomy 18, 18, and that prophet, hmm. and basically tying that to 1 John chapters 9, um, verses 19 through 23, and when John the Baptist is asked, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Or are you that prophet? My question is, how do you differentiate the prophet that God Almighty stated in mm. the Old Testament in tying that to the knowledge that the Jews had when they asked John the Baptist? Okay, so you're referring to a, um, it was a very important passage in the early church. Even the apostle Peter uses it in his message in Acts chapter 3. Moses says, a, a, a prophet will rise among your people. It'll be some like Moses. Now, it's true, you can also read about the false prophet, but let's focus on the true prophet section. This, if he's going to be like Moses, Moses was a leader of the people. He did miracles. He brought the law. He had an intimate relationship with God. And if we look for any other, uh, we go through the rest of the Old Testament, there's no one else who is that. There's no prophet who matches that until you get to Jesus. But as Peter explains, he's more than a prophet. I know the Muslims use that to say it's talking about Muhammad, but the problem is, if you read Deuteronomy 18, it's got to be a Jewish person. I don't think that'll sit very well. And it's kind of like taking John 14 and saying that's talking about Muhammad instead of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but that would be our response on Deuteronomy 18. Uh, it's, a, it's a figure like Moses. In the New Testament, we see that's Jesus. But there's no one else from Deuteronomy all the way to the end of the Old Testament. No one else fits the bill. Okay, we've got nine minutes left, so I want to make sure that we get as many questions in as possible. So next question, you'll have to direct it to one or the other to make sure that we can get as many questions as possible. I'm sorry you won't have time to rebut <laughs> what the other person says, please. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for coming to, to share with us. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. You referenced uh, a... Speak into You referenced a... Uh, development about the uh, divinity of Jesus through the Gospels. I was wondering if you have considered that the, the different Gospels were written by the authors for different purposes. Just like uh, the letters in the mm -hmm. New Testament are written to address misconceptions or misdeeds, the, the Gospels were all written for specific reasons. Matthew to the Jews, John for the Gentiles, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, yes. So the Gospels were written by various writers in different times and different places, and obviously they had their own individual reasons and proclivities in their writing. But uh, one, one point should be clear, that the most important claim about Jesus has to be represented in all of them. It's like, uh, you know, the, the president of this great country makes uh, an, an earth-shaking declaration. Well, then every, every newspaper has, has to mention that. Or some tweet. may mention some details that the others do not mention, but you cannot have the most important message missed. If Jesus was God who came into the world, this is the most important thing to know about him, and it is uh, unthinkable that uh, the writers uh, would not make mention of this fact if, the, if that were indeed a fact that they knew about. Uh, we see the transformation going on, and we can see that the, the purposes of the later writers is to transform the message of Jesus to make Jesus look bigger and greater. So so that in Mark's gospel, when Jesus was asleep in the boat, the disciples came to him and they rebuked him. They're saying, teacher, do you not care if we drown? Go to Matthew's gospel, same episode. The disciples say, master, save us, we're drowning. Now, it's not the same message. It's not the same saying of the disciples. The message has been transformed from one gospel to another. And we can see the proclivity of the later writers to make Jesus appear bigger and greater than he appeared in the previous gospel. Okay, thank you. Next question. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. This has been really, really helpful. Um, this question is to Dr. Jacoby. Mm -hmm. um, so my understanding is that a lot of the other, other Gospels use Mark or some of Mark to encompass what, they, what, they, what was written. Um, so to Ali, Dr. Ali's point of um, sort of the progressive nature of the Gospels, um, could there be other Gospels? Um, could there be a My name is Michelle Wright. I'll be serving as the moderator uh, for this evening's debate between Dr. Shabir Ali and Dr. Douglas Jacoby. It's entitled, 
is Jesus prophet or son of God? Thank you so much for joining us this evening and taking time out of your very busy schedules. Dr. Ali, thank you for coming to Georgia and joining us here all the way down it's from Toronto. Pleasure. It's great to have you here. This, in fact, is the third debate between these two men, and it's designed to be a very respectful debate, which is great. Uh, their first debate was 10 years ago, back in 2008, and that was on the topic, the true legacy of Abraham. Their second debate was just last year in Toronto, and they debated on violence, the Bible, and the Quran. Again, this is designed to be a very respectful debate that's in, designed to engage you in some dialogue about Jesus, who lived some 2,000 years ago. In Islam, Jesus is a great prophet, but not divine. In Christianity, Jesus is the Son of God. So these two aspects of Jesus will be what we are discussing tonight during this forum in the next few hours. I say we because it's not just the men on stage here that will be talking you will actually get the opportunity to ask some questions. There is some time that is set aside for the audience to ask questions of both doctors, Jacoby and Ali. What I ask is that you keep your questions to 30 seconds or less. If that helps, you might want to write something down so you can keep it down. I have instructed the sound engineer, if you go beyond the 30 seconds, to silence your mic so we can be respectful and have as many people as possible be able to ask as many questions as possible. So we mm -hmm. want to be fair. I will signal the time during that Q&A. You'll come up here. You'll be able to ask your question to whichever of the, debater, the debaters you would like, or you can ask both of them. Now, speaking of these two fine men that are up here on stage with me, I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. Dr. Ali holds an MA and a PhD in Islamic Studies from the University of Toronto. He also has a BA in Religious Studies with a specialization in Biblical Literature. Dr. Ali lives in Toronto where for the last 30 years he's been actively involved in the Muslim community and he's also quite involved with several interfaith dialogues and initiatives around the world. In fact, he's known as one of the top, if not the top debaters in the Muslim world.